Welcome to Ox Hill Baptist Church. We are grateful that you have chosen to join with us on this morning. We have a few announcements we would like to, to make as we gather together. First, we hope you've enjoyed your time in Sunday school for the Zoom and uh, Google Meeting classes. If you would like to be a part of a Sunday school class, uh, you can uh, do so by looking in your Connect, and there's several listed there, or contact the church office, and we will help you get uh, involved in one of those online uh, Sunday school meetings. Also, the women's Bible study is continuing to meet on Sunday night at 5 p.m. If you want to talk to Carol Harsh about joining that, that would be wonderful. The youth are also meeting on Sunday night, so if you have a youth that you would uh, like to participate in that, please uh, talk to John Majet. On Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. and then at 7 p.m., our children and then our adults meet. Our children at 6 via Zoom and our adults at 7 via Zoom. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can see or talk to Sarah or myself. We also want to, to continue to thank you for your generosity and your support of the church. We are grateful for this support. We also want to offer you and encourage you to support the Easter offering as well. The Easter offering will be divided up in three ways, uh, a third to the WFCM, the Western Fairfax Christian Ministry, a third will go to rebuilding together here in our community, and then a third will be going to the BGAV uh, disaster response and their work and their help uh, around our state and the world. And so please consider uh, giving some money to the Easter offering as well. Uh, we encourage you to continue to check out the connects that go out on Tuesday and Thursday. And if you would like to be a part of that email list, just email the church and we will add your uh, name to the list of those that we are contacting and sending that connect out every Tuesday and Friday. So we thank you so much uh, for this time that you have gathered with us let us now join our hearts and minds together in worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice. 
church family. I miss you all so much and looking forward to when we can worship together again. Will you join me now together in prayer? Holy Father, we come to you in prayer. You alone are worthy of praise, glory, and honor. We praise you for your steadfast love and for the salvation that Jesus provided through that love. We lift up our praise to you, our God of mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. Praise you for revealing yourself to us through your word, by your Holy Spirit, and in your creation. We humble ourselves before you and honor your holy, everlasting name. Lord, we cry out to you. Hear our prayers of confession. We come to you with heavy hearts, ashamed of our sinfulness and need of your forgiveness. We are sorry for not putting you first priority over our life and spending quiet time in prayer and in your word daily. Forgive our disobedience and neglect of the things you have called and asked us to do. Forgive us for the wrong we have done, for the people we have hurt, and for those we have failed to love as you love. Thank you for your being our solid rock, our fortress, our safe place, in these uncertain times. We know that nothing is impossible with you, O God. Thank you for your sovereignty and that you never grow weary as sometimes we do in these times of change and social distancing. God, you walk with us through these valleys and even hold us when we feel we can't go on. And for that, we are so thankful. We are in awe of how your hand is upon each of us as you are working in this situation. Even when we cannot see the signs of what you are doing, we have the confident hope that you are providing. In the powerful name of Jesus, we boldly ask for the healing of our land. We ask for wisdom for the doctors, scientists, leaders as decisions are being made with COVID-19. As we lift up those who are in the front lines, nurses, physicians, first responders, medical technicians, delivery drivers, pharmacists, grocery clerks, we ask for your shield of safety and strength to pour over them. Provide comfort and peace to those who are anxious and depressed and alone. Help us to be the light of Christ in this dark world and point others to the hope in God alone. I pray this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. So this morning, I'm going to ask that you do a little activity with me, okay? I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to ask it for you to stare at a part of that picture for about 15 seconds. And then I'm gonna tell you to do something and ask you what you see. All right, so get comfy, cause you're gonna be, you know, staring at something for a little while longer than you're probably normally still. All right, ready? I want you to look at this picture. I want you to stare at the four dots right there in the middle. And I would like you to stare and I will let you know what, when to close your eyes, all right? Stare straight at the picture. All right, close your eyes. What do you see? 
Did anybody see the face of Jesus? So this is one of those optical illusions. When you look at it a certain way, you will see certain things. And this one, when most people look at it for a while and then close their eyes or stare at a blank wall, they see the face of Jesus or someone's depiction of Jesus. So today, Pastor Brad is going to preach a sermon about the walk to Emmaus. And it's about these two followers of Jesus who are on their way back to their town of Emmaus. And they're talking about everything that happened with Jesus's um, crucifixion and death. And they're opening the scriptures um, and talking about them. And a man joins them and starts talking about the scriptures with them. And then they invite that man to dinner. And when they go to dinner and that man breaks the bread, they realize it was Jesus. It was Jesus with them the whole time walking with them. But they didn't realize it until they took a time to slow down. So Pastor Brad is going to encourage us to slow down and look for Jesus. Guess what? Now is the perfect time for all of us to slow down and look for Jesus because some of us have a lot more time on our hands and we don't have a lot of distractions that we normally do. So we need to slow down and look for Jesus. And we can look for Jesus in nature or in other people. We can take walks like these two guys on the road to Emmaus and we can look for Jesus in our lives. So I encourage you to slow down even if you have to take a 15 second counting break like we did at the beginning to look at the picture and look for Jesus all around you. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, help us to slow down and see Jesus as he walks with us every day. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Good morning. This morning I'm reading from the book of Luke 24, 13 through 35. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood together, their faces downcast, and one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since this all took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish are you? And how slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer for these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if they were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told us what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
$915.68. Keep that number in mind. $915.68. Imagine with me eight weeks ago, you were driving home from work, hungry and ready to eat. You go to a fast food restaurant, right? No. You stop by the gas station, you fill the tank with that high octane premium gasoline, you run inside and you grab a fresh panini, a three cheese pesto, and a double espresso, and you take off for home. See, you're part of that swelling demographic in America who dislike fast food, but you don't have time to cook. So you bypass the elaborate meal at home, and you've discovered the joy of not cooking, and therefore you go with what we call home meal replacements. Or you swing by the Harris Teeter. You slide in their fresh food section and you make yourself a nice salad and you get a cup of soup in order to eat as soon as you walk in the door of your home. Or maybe what you've done is when you got to your car at work, you pulled up Grubhub or DoorDash and you ordered yourself a meal from your favorite restaurant to be delivered to your home so it is there just a matter of minutes after you get there. Did you know in 1987, 43% of all meals made at home included at least one item made from scratch. That number has now declined to 28% of meals have at least one item made from scratch. That means 72% of meals have zero items made from scratch. Cooking has become more of a hobby nowadays than it is something that we do out of necessity. We are relying heavily on pre-packaged, ready-made foods, and they've become increasingly popular. Remember $915.68? We'll, we'll get there. When and how did all of this start? Well, back in 1879, Heinz uh, produced the first bottle of ketchup and marketed it with an ad that said, for the blessed relief of mother and other women of the household. In 1953, just a year before um, the first McDonald's, the Golden Arches went up, a Swanson food uh, dietitian named Betty Cronin created the first TV dinner. This was at a time when meals took on average about two hours to produce and make. And TV dinners hit the shelves with the promise of providing great relief to mothers, it said, burdened uh, with baby boom offspring. What once took two hours has now been, and I quote, shrink wrapped to a tidy 15 minutes. Two hours to cook? Most of you say, I don't think so. We like the world we live in. Many of us enjoy the fast and easy method of preparing and eating food. What do you think were on the minds of the two individuals walking on the road to Emmaus? Yes, of course, they were talking about the events of the past week, but when they arrived home, they immediately began to eat. Jesus even seemed to have food on his mind as he ate with them. See, Jesus seems to actually enjoy food, and many of the stories in the Gospels tell of his love of food. The wedding feast at Cana, the feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children. He ate with tax collectors and sinners and sat at the table with disciples. Once he was asked by the Pharisees why his disciples were eating and drinking and not fasting and praying 
like the followers of John the Baptist. And Jesus answered, you cannot make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? He spent his final hours reclined in the upper room with his disciples, eating a meal that we now refer to as the Last Supper. And in the book of Revelation, it refers to the, not just the marriage of the Lamb, but the marriage supper of the Lamb. Feast and food are a part of life, even in the first century. And certainly Jesus took part of it. $915.68. Remember that number. See, you're starting to realize that this sermon is about food. Correct, but not of the physical kind. The text we read today from Luke chapter 24 are about two individuals, two men and Jesus, as they encounter one another on the road to Emmaus. The two men were walking, talking, and uh, telling of their experience of the last week in their life and the life of Jesus and all that had happened in Jerusalem. And they were excited and probably scared and they were probably coming up with some conspiracy theories and then debunking their own conspiracy theories about what happened. And they were talking about what might have happened and who said what and what said who. And, and they were just having a great old casual conversation as they walked down the road. And here all of a sudden, surprisingly, some individual, a man, shows up in their midst. Later, we realize that this is Jesus, and they find it out too. But at the moment, they did not know who this individual was. And then Jesus begins to reveal scriptures to them and tells them of how it was fulfillment of prophecy of all the things that happened during this past week. And it later says their hearts burn as the scripture was revealed and opened up to them. It wasn't until the breaking of bread that their eyes were open and they realized it was Jesus in their midst. And they were amazed at all that they had been taught and that they had been walking with Jesus, being taught by Jesus and experiencing life with Jesus on that long walk to Emmaus. But what do we gain from this story? What do we gain in our life from this story that we've had read to us from Luke 24? I must admit that this story gained a newfound impact on my life after I attended what is referred to as an Emmaus walk of my own 10 years ago in March of 2010. The walk to Emmaus is an ecumenical three-day weekend spiritual retreat. It's uh, designed to help draw you closer to God and prepare you to be a better Christian and leader. Through a series of talks and activities and disciplines, your eyes are opened and your heart burns for Christ. At least mine did. It was through my Emmaus Walk experience that the joy that had been sucked out of my life through the work of doing ministry, to be honest with you, uh, re-entered me and gave me a new perspective. It was through that experience that I truly gained the understanding of eating the fish and spitting out the bones. See, I no longer, after this experience on my Emmaus walk, allowed the critical, harsh people of my life to control me. But rather, I gleaned what I could from their remarks and I moved on. See, I was in a pretty rotten place in life before my spiritual retreat known as the walk to Emmaus. But I didn't know it. See, I had allowed the critical, harsh-talking people to slowly suck the joy out of my life. And I was more going through the motions of my spiritual life and my Christian walk than I was gaining anything from it. And so this three-day retreat reinvigorized my soul and allowed me to find a truth about God, but also about myself, knowing that I needed to stop listening to certain people 
maybe hear the truth and move on and not allow them and their critique to control my life and my attitude and my perspective. See, it was through a slow, deliberate walk with Jesus during this time, these three days, that led me to communing with God that ultimately allowed my heart to burn and life to change. See, the walk to Emmaus, not just the one that I went on, but the one we find here in Luke chapter 24, teach us something about life. And the first thing I believe it teaches us is the importance of slowing down. Now, some of you are sitting here saying, I don't think my life can get any slower. See, because one of the things that have happened over the last several weeks is the coronavirus, COVID-19, has caused us to literally slow down our lives. I believe it's been a benefit of it. The physical distancing, the social distancing that we call it, the not having to commute to and from work, the not having the burdens of so many meetings that you have to travel to or go to at all have been forcing us to slow down. I see this as a great benefit in our lives because too often we seem to steadily be busy and going along our way, going, going, going faster and faster our calendars become enamored with too many things uh, to the point where we have multiple meetings and events and things scheduled that are overlapping each other. We leave one meeting simply to go to the next, often having to leave one meeting early to go to the next meeting that is starting before the last meeting has even ended. We find ourselves going too fast, not just at work, but in our volunteer activities. We go, go, go. In our church work, we seem to always be going faster and faster, more and more, just to keep us entertained, busy, feeling like we're checking off those boxes of our Christ-like work. And we keep doing it and going and going faster and faster to the point where we simply don't know how to slow down. But now, many of us have found ourselves a little slower. So what are you doing in a little bit of slowness? The walk to Emmaus here in Luke chapter 24 teaches us another thing. As we slowly walk the road to Emmaus and find ourselves easing through the day a little bit more, it allows us the opportunity to commune with Jesus. See, you have a lot of choices right now of who you want to commune with, don't you? Your spouse, your kid, and Jesus. Well, that was a quicker list than I thought it was going to be. But that's your list right now. However, during this time, I hope you take the opportunity to commune with Jesus and allow yourself to sit at the table of God's grace and learn and grow in that grace. If you say to me today, well, I don't have time, I'm still busy, then listen to this, slow down anyways. Our communing with Jesus is important because as we commune with Jesus, our hearts burn. We get reinvigorated in our faith. We connect to God in these moments. We allow Jesus to open his heart and his desires for our life up. And we realize something about ourselves. We realize a truth about scripture, about the living word of God. And it allows us to be different and change those things in our life that so desperately need to be changed. So commune with Jesus, sit down, relax in the arms of God, listen, commune with God. 
And lastly, I believe this passage of Scripture is also teaching us that we should not forget the importance of community. As we slow down and as we have offered ourselves time to commune with Jesus, let us not forget the importance of community. See, they did not only commune with Jesus and each other, but they ran back. They hurried back. It was only after their slow, deliberate walk and communing with Jesus that they actually got in a hurry. And the hurry was this, that in the same hour, it says, it was to tell others that they had experienced Jesus. It wasn't to set up another meeting or to, to do some of the superficial work that we like to call life. But it was to tell others that they had experienced Jesus and they had seen and been able to commune with Christ. They told him the story of the walk and they told them of the breaking of bread. And it was to relay and tell them about the experience that they had with Christ. They told their community. This passage of scripture reminds us of the importance of community. And there is a time for us to engage our community, to tell them and share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. We do that most effectively when we slow down and take time for ourselves to commune with Christ so that our lives can be reinvigorated so that we can then go and share and serve and tell others the good news. I imagine that we have a couple of groups of people watching today. There's a group of people who have been so busy, so hurried, so fast in their life that slowing down is difficult for them. But then you have another group of people, I would say, that fall on the other end of that category that have been living a slow paced life, that have been slowing down, at least in their spiritual walk for so long that they simply do nothing. We learn through this passage of scripture that we can slow down, commune with Jesus, but yet also impact our community in positive ways for Jesus Christ by telling and sharing of our faith. $915.68. That is the average amount of money per person that we spent on fast food in 2018. $915.68. That's an increase of over 200% over the last 20 years. That's over $3,000 for a family of four that you spent in one year on fast food. Now, I'm not here to tell you of your fast food uh, problems or to tell you to stop eating fast food. That's not what I'm here today. But I believe that number is indicative of the problem that we have in our fast pace lifestyle. We live so fast, so quick. I have some fears. It is because of this fast paced lifestyle that I, what I fear is that I have been missing out by being so busy in life. My hurried busyness has taken me away from my family, my friends, and to some extent, my joy in order for me to do church. My prayer is that in this season of change, that we will slow down, commune with God, readdress our priorities, so that as we gather again one day in community, we won't make the same mistakes again. May each of us find the grace of Christ during this time. Amen.
And now as you go, slow down, commune with Christ, and allow your hearts to burn. And as you do so, may Christ go before you, come behind you, and reside within you from now till forevermore. And now let us pray the prayer that our Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.